Well, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Beth Johnston. I'm the C Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. And together here with Ms. June Kinoshida, our Director of Research and Patient Education, we'd like to welcome you to this month's FSHD University webinar. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, the FSHD Society is the world's largest research-focused patient adv advocacy organization. It is always such a mouthful and I can never say it all in one, one stop there. Um, but we are focused solely on FSHD. We have 33 chapters across the US and now in Canada, and we are part of a 20 country World FSHD Alliance. Hi, Shelley. Our mission is to find treatments and a cure for FSHD while empowering our families. So, um, we offer these free FSHD University webinars and so many other educational events to educate and empower individuals and their loved ones um, to live their best lives, both physically and mentally. So speaking of empowering educational events, our biannual FSHD Connect Conference is coming this June 18th and 19th in Orlando, Florida. FSHD Connect is the society's flagship educational event and it's held only every other year. Um, and it's the world's biggest network event for FSHD. It brings together hundreds of individuals and their families, clinicians, researchers. It's two days of immersive learning and workshops. Um, you'll find out about the latest in research in drug development and clinical trials, and um, as well as a wealth of news and resources you can use. And perhaps you might even have a little bit of fun. We're planning lots of fun things this year. So um, if you haven't already, please register to join us at the URL that you see here. Um, you can choose to join us either in person in Orlando or virtually via our live stream platform for the plenary sessions. Um, but hurry, that early bird deadline is quickly approaching. It's April 30th. So we hope you all can join us for that. So with that, today from our physical and mental health departments, we welcome an amazing multidisciplinary panel to discuss approaches to managing pain in individuals with FSHD. The infamous team today are from the University of Iowa. Uh, we have neurologist Kathy Matthews, physical therapist Shelley Mockler, and psychologist Krista Cole. So welcome everybody. I'm Kathy Matthews. Um, I'm a neuromuscular doc at the University of Iowa, and I'm joined, as uh, June said, by Krista Cole, a clinical psychologist, and Shelley Mochler, a neuromuscular physical therapist, to talk a little bit about pain in FSHD. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to do a brief overview of some of the literature on pain, and there's not a ton, but give you some um, sort of what is available, what is known about pain in FSHD, and then talk br very briefly about medication. Krista will then talk about the concepts of pain, current understanding of pain, and some introduction to techniques that can be used to help manage pain. And then Shelley will follow up with um, physical management um, techniques for uh, pain, dealing with pain. So um, pain is not an uncommon problem in people with FSHD. So I've put on here three relatively large studies that looked at frequency of pain in FSHD, and they all run between 80 and 90% of adults report pain if they have FSHD. And two of these are surveys, and one of these was a registry data. About 20% had um, severe pain described as greater than seven on a one to 10 scale. About 50% reported chronic pain, and they described or they defined that as persistent pain for more than 12 weeks within a single year in the past five years. So, so we're not talking about daily, every day I get out of bed pain, but that's you, you need to note that definition there. Um, so the take home from all of those um, relatively large studies is that if you have FSHD and you experience pain, you are not alone. This occurs, but there are approaches to managing it, and that is why we are here today. So the literature tells us that the most common areas that people with FSHD experience pain are low back and shoulders, and both of those were reported by about 70%, and these are um, results from two different studies. The image shows you that, again, 71, 72% reported pain in the shoulders and lower back, and a survey study reported 72, 70, or 70 shoulders and 74 low back. So those are the most common, but you can see from that, the image of the little guy there, that um, pain can certainly affect other body areas in people with FSHD. 
So it would be really nice if we knew that, you know, you didn't have pain until you hit this point in your disease, or we knew that this, this group of people were going to be the ones with pain and this group isn't, but really it has a very complex, in the literature, pain has a complex relationship with stage of disease. When people have looked at it, they found no consistent relationship with the D4Z4 fragment, which is that genetic test that um, is associated some weekly with severity in FSHD type one, um, there was no consistent relationship with age among adults and dura or duration of disease. So a few of the studies made it look like pain was most common in young adults and middle-aged adults and less at the you know, children and, um, and older adults, but that was not entirely consistent. And similarly, there was no simple relationship with mobility status. The, there were some studies that indicated that those who had no difficulty walking whatsoever were less likely to report pain. But beyond that, the different, there was no difference between those who were in a wheelchair and those who were not in a wheelchair. So it's a, we can't necessarily predict who is going to have pain in, among those with FSHD. Um, this is a like, duh. So pain affects your quality of life. Yes, this has been studied. Um, pain impacts your mobility, your ability to work, your ability to sleep, your mood, and your overall enjoyment of life. So it is can be an issue. And so given that it is a not uncommon problem, what do we do to approach it? So when you talk to your doctor about pain, um, we really the first step is to under for us to try to understand what it is you're feeling. And so we need the details. So we need you to tell us where the pain is, what kind of pain is it, what makes it better and worse. So when a patient comes in and says, I just hurt all over all the time, that makes it really hard for me to know how to tailor my management. Um, so the more information you can give us, the better your um, the better advice your healthcare team can give you. So pay attention to your pain. I mean, I don't like to tell people to perseverate on it, but um, if you're going to the doctor, try to think about it in advance, what would be helpful to tell the doctor? And the biggest thing probably is what makes it better? What makes it worse? When does it occur? And then based on what you tell us and what we see on exam, we'll decide whether or not any other specific testing is needed, x-rays or blood work or whatever. But most of, many times we don't need to do additional testing. We'll also think about whether or not another kind of specialist is needed. If your primary problem is belly pain, we might say you need to see a GI doctor, not a, not a neurologist or a primary care doctor. And then, and this is super important, um, we want to know, we need to know how big a deal is this for you? Is this something that, you know, yeah, you get up in the morning and you feel a little stiff and you hurt a little bit and you move around, and you feel better and it's an annoyance, but it's not really a problem problem? Or is this something that really impacts your life? Is it making it so you don't want to go out and do things because you hurt all the time? You're, you're avoiding family and friends. Um, is this something that is dramatically impacting your life and really needs management? So if you have something that needs management, um, the sort of way we are going to approach it, first of all, we're going to try to determine, is there a clear modifiable cause? And this goes back to the giving us the details about the pain. So if it only hurts, if I sit in this particular chair for an hour, those are really easy. And I'm very, very happy because I'm going to say, well, don't sit in that chair for an hour. But most of the time, we don't get something that easy. But, but sometimes there is a modifiable cause, you know, maybe you need to sit down at work rather than standing, or maybe you could have something put lower or higher in your workplace and, and move things around so that it doesn't cause pain. If we need to do something more specific, we divide it into pharmacologic treatment and non-pharmacologic treatment, where pharmacologic is medication, non-pharmacological is physical and cognitive treatments that Krista and Shelley are going to talk about. And, um, I always remind people, I'm a neurologist, so I have to remind people of this, and this is sort of, Chris is going to talk more about this, but remember that pain occurs in the brain. If the brain isn't involved, like if you're under anesthesia, you don't feel that pain. The brain has to be involved in order to feel pain. Similarly, if you have an amputation, you can still have a pain in that amputated limb because the brain is the one that experiences the pain. So the the brain-body relationship is incredibly important in, in pain. 
and pain is experienced in the brain. The other important thing is that treatment is a process. There is no magic wand. I can't go on Amazon, get my illuminating wand, sprinkle, wave it over you and make pain disappear. Pain is complex. It's different for each person. And there sometimes is a process in coming up with the best management for your pain. When we think about medications, we almost always start with over-the-counter pain medications. So ibuprofen, acetaminophen, naproxen, naproxen, those things are the ones that we almost always start with. And you need to work with your usually your primary care doctor to make sure that, that um, if there's any monitoring that needs to be done, if you're needing to use them all the time, that you're getting that. Um, the, the prescription non-steroidals are usually are often a next line level of therapy. So um, I've given some examples. We may then add on other kinds of medicines like anticonvulsants, antidepressants, or muscle relaxants. We might recommend creams or patches. We try to avoid opioids as much as possible. And sometimes the orthopods or rehab doctors will do a joint injection. So we almost all medicines have side effect. We always want to try to use the lowest dose possible to achieve the goal. Um, sometimes medicines are best managed by a pain specialist. So if you're having a lot of problems with pain, we've done the first line therapies. We may very well recommend that you go to a pain clinic where you are going to be dealt with by a group that specializes in pain management. And finally, the treatment of chronic pain is most successful when you use more than one approach, medicine and a non-pharmacologic approach or approaches. So just very briefly, what do we know about how pain in FSHD is managed? So this is a chart review study by MD Starnet. So looking at um, hundreds of people and about 30% of patients with FSHD are on prescription pain medicines for more than six weeks, so more than just acute pain management. And about a half of those are on an opioid, and that's the lighter red. And that's similar to other kinds of muscular dystrophies. So I've shown here are FSHD, limb girdle, and myotonic. And about a third of all of those are on um, pharmacologic management for pain. Duchenne is less likely. And sort of similar results were seen in the UK in a study from 2018 where non-steroidals um, and opioids were each used by about a third of patients with FSHD. Um, the study from the UK in 2018 also looked at non-pharmacologic management and the top five, because it's kind of hard to read, are exercise, aqua therapy, acupuncture, massage, and heat. So those are important things to go with your, your medication management. And then this study looked at what do people continue to use? Um, so people try a lot of things for pain. This one looked at what do people continue to use? And this is a combination of FSHD and myotonic dystrophy patients. And the characteristics of the medicines that were continued to use or the treatments that were continued to use were that they were readily available, they had few or no side effects, and they provided at least moderate pain relief for the people who took them. So those are, are good goals to have. So summary of my part, pain is not uncommon for people who live with FSHD, and it can be similar to osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. It's, similar, it's hard to predict who's going to be affected. There's no single best treatment that's gonna work for everybody. It's a balance of risks and benefits, and you might need to explore a couple options, and treatment is not just a medicine, and that's the reason that um, Krista and Shelley are going to speak. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Krista Cole. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Let me just pull up my screen here. Okay, can everyone see my slides okay? All right, so pain is not just a physical sensory experience. So when we think about and conceptualize chronic pain, we understand it from a biopsychosocial perspective. So what that means is there are multiple factors that contribute to pain. As Dr. Matthews was explaining, pain is in the brain. And what that means is that we have to consider not only biological factors, but also psychological and social factors as well. So of course, things like having a physical disease or your health um, or genetic factors are one component of pain. So is one's social environment. So 
work, friends, family, um, your culture, things that are happening in kind of the larger society, all of these things can influence pain as well. Um, and then psychological factors. So things like stress, anxiety, depression, also one's individual beliefs about pain. So if you are someone that has struggled with pain for a long time, it's likely that you've had some negative past experiences with it. So it makes sense then that if something has hurt you in the past, you may be afraid of it hurting again. So movement, for example, if you know, oh, every time I get out of this chair or move from this chair to the bed, it's painful. That makes sense that you have this belief that this is going to hurt. So those beliefs can actually perpetuate pain and they can be a part of that cycle of keeping pain in place. And really the most important thing to know about the biopsychosocial model is that it's all of these factors that interact together to create pain. So that means we have to address pain from multiple perspectives as well. We can't just target one intervention and expect that pain gets better. We have to really take into, con you know, into consideration all of the different factors that can contribute to pain. Let's talk about chronic pain and mental health. So we know there's high comorbidity, there's a high correlation between chronic pain and mental health disorders. So up to 85% of patients that have chronic pain are also affected by severe depression. And what we understand about that is that some of the same specific areas in the brain that process pain also process depression. In fact, some of the same neurotransmitters, some of the same chemicals that are happening in the brain are happening in both when pain occurs, as it develops over time, in what maintains it, and then in how we treat pain. Um, when it comes to anxiety, up to 60% of people with chronic pain also have anxiety. Similarly, anxiety is processed in the brain, but specifically anxiety runs on our nervous system. So we have our sympathetic nervous system response or that fight or flight response, where when someone experiences anxiety or fear, things like your heart increases, you know, your heart rate, your breathing might get rapid, your muscles might get tense. That's a very similar response to what happens when we have pain. You know, when something hurts, your muscles tense, your heart rate increases, your breathing might change. So there's some of that same activity in both. So of course, anxiety can make pain worse and having pain can give you more anxiety. And lastly, trauma. So up to 50% of people that have chronic pain also have post-traumatic stress symptoms. So they may not meet the full criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder, but do have some trauma symptoms. And one of the symptoms we think about a lot with trauma is hypervigilance. And so people who have chronic pain and trauma can sometimes have what's called somatic hypervigilance. So hypervigilance is kind of being aware of your surroundings. So if you think of an example of someone who's been through something traumatic, maybe um, someone who's been in war or heard gunfire, and then they hear a loud sound, even if they're safe, that loud sound might trigger feelings of fear from their past trauma. Well, someone that has had chronic pain may feel something in their body that might just be a normal trigger. Maybe their stomach gurgles and it makes a little noise. So what most people might think, oh, that's nothing, I'm a little hungry or it's fine. Well, someone who's had really severe GI pain or has vomited a lot um, or has this negative history of it might feel a gurgle in their stomach and think, oh no, here we go again. This is gonna be really bad. My stomach is gonna be in a lot of pain. I'm gonna need to use the bathroom. I can't go do what I was gonna do later. And so you become kind of hyper aware of scanning your body for cues of pain. So kind of like as Dr. Matthews was saying, you don't want to perseverate and always worry about pain, but you want to strike that balance between tracking your pain, being able to speak to it and define it, while at the same time not constantly focusing on pain being a sign that something is wrong or something bad is going to happen. And another good thing to know about all of these conditions, really depression, anxiety, and trauma, is they're all very treatable. So what we know is, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, is well-researched and very effective as a treatment for depression, for anxiety. Um, even trauma-focused CBT is great for healing some of these past traumas. So seeking treatment for mental health can really help treat pain as well and is really a necessary component of treating pain. Because we know they're all connected, there could be this negative cycle. So it really is hard to kind of parse out one factor versus another that's driving the relationship. 
I mean, when you have pain, it can make it difficult to sleep. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're tired, you don't feel like exercising or doing anything. So when you're not as physically active, that can make pain worse. Your pain is worse. You can't do things. You, you it starts to affect your mood. Maybe you feel kind of down or anxious. Again, that makes it hard to sleep, makes it hard to have energy, and it just sort of starts this whole negative cycle. So the reason that I'm talking about this is not that it's all negative and everything makes everything worse, but this is also how you get out of that cycle is understanding that these factors influence one another. So in order to get pain better, focusing on something like, okay, maybe if I improve my sleep and I start to get a little more active, that can actually pull you out of the cycle in the same way that when those factors are involved can make things worse. So this is why we cannot treat just pain alone in isolation and expect it to improve, but really, really do have to address any other mood conditions, anxiety, problems with sleep, being physically active, because putting it all together is what stops this negative cycle and what can pull you out of pain. So let's talk about some actual practical skills that we can use. And relaxation is a big one. We know that this is helpful for pain, this is helpful for anxiety, for mood. Um, so one of the most simple basic things that you can do, and we can even all practice this together right now, is taking a diaphragmatic breath. So what that means, it's kind of the opposite of like hyperventilating and breathing all in the upper chest, kind of that kind of shortness of breath. So instead, you want to sort of drop your shoulders down, relax, focus on air filling up through the belly. So we can just take a deep breath in together now. Inhale and then slow exhale. If we take another breath together like that, breathing in and slowly breathing out. So even just doing something as simple as taking a couple of diaphragmatic breaths can really calm the body, calm the mind. The key to it being really effective is practice. So of course, if you're in a very anxious moment or in a lot of pain, it's really hard to do that kind of breath or maybe a couple breaths isn't going to do very much. But if you're practicing it regularly, maybe as part of just a routine as you go to bed at night or when you get up in the morning, your body gets used to that slow breathing as being the cue for your entire body to relax. And that's what you're training is the relaxation response. So breathing is really great, but there are many other skills as well. So if breathing is you know, not working for you or not your thing, um, there's also focusing more on the mind. So using guided imagery. So we have a nice picture here of the beach and the ocean, and that's great when you can take a vacation or kind of, you know, see pictures like this, but sometimes that's not possible and you're in a stressful situation, right? So what you can do with guided imagery is kind of bring to mind, you know, a positive memory or a positive place and really not only picturing it like we think of just visually imagining what it would look like, but also, you know, what would it feel like if you were there? Could you feel sand in your toes or the warmth of the sun? Could you hear sounds like the ocean waves coming in and smell smells of like, you know, flowers or hear other, other sounds? Just kind of really enriching that experience by bringing in those sensory pieces can actually have some of the same impact as really being there physically. Again, with practice, that's a skill that you can get better and better at so that if you're somewhere you know, you can kind of bring up an image and be like, oh yeah, my body remembers how that feels to think about that. And then lastly, there's progressive muscle relaxation. So this is a little bit more active and hands-on. It's kind of a series of tensing and releasing different muscle groups. So it might start with even at the toes, sort of pushing your toes down or tightening your feet just to kind of act like you're maybe pushing your feet into mud or sand. And you're focusing on that feeling of tension for about five seconds and then letting it go. Completely relaxing the feet and the toes, maybe wiggling them a little bit and really feeling for about 10 seconds what that relaxation feels like. And then you might move up through calves and thighs and stomach and even neck and shoulders and face and just kind of taking the time to really tense for five seconds and release for about 10 seconds. And as you're doing that, you're kind of controlling your body's response by saying, okay, I'm tensing and I'm relaxing. And that helps all the muscles to relax. 
So let's also talk a little bit about mindfulness meditation. So we hear a lot about this. It's a very popular um, topic at the time and lots of great research support coming out about the effectiveness of meditation, not only for managing pain, but also anxiety, other mental health issues. So I wanted to define terms a little bit. Um, mindfulness or being mindful is really awareness. So it's being present. You can be mindful in anything that you do. You don't have to physically sit and formally practice meditation to be mindful. Meditation is really that time where you sit and devote time to the practice. So you may sit or lie down comfortably and just focus your attention on the breath. And here, the breath is more of an anchor. So you're not controlling it like you would for a diaphragmatic breath where you're intentionally slowing it. But you're just letting yourself breathe normally and having it be the focus of your mind's attention. I think for all of us, if you sit and are quiet and still and focus on the breath, your mind wants to wander. That's what the mind does. That's normal to have a million thoughts going through your head. So as you notice those thoughts, the goal is to just notice them and bring your attention back to the breathing. Five seconds later, you have another thought. You just notice it and bring your attention back to the breathing. And you repeat that process over and over again, which essentially is strengthening your mind's ability to do just that, to be distracted and to reorient your attention. And that's how mindfulness and meditation can benefit pain in the long term is over time, you get better and better at learning how to notice a sensation in the body. Maybe it's pain, letting it go and returning to the present moment and doing what you want to do. So there are plenty of ways to practice meditation, lots of forms of meditation out there. Um, but I would even encourage you to think about just trying to incorporate it into your daily activities. So maybe if you're brushing your teeth or you're cooking dinner, you know, or getting dressed in the morning, it can be a very simple thing that you're doing every day, but just choosing one thing and saying, okay, I'm going to try to be mindful during this one thing. Try to just keep your mind's focus on paying attention to that one activity. It's challenging, but it can help you kind of start down that path of seeing if mindfulness is something that can be helpful for you. Okay, so lastly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, everything that I've discussed so far. So the key being that practice piece. So any of those skills like relaxation, mindfulness are not going to work instantly. They're things that you do need to practice over time. If you do have symptoms of anxiety, depression, trauma, um, there are treatments available to you. So I would really encourage you to seek that out. And especially cognitive behavioral therapy, as I said, is a great treatment for those conditions. So if you're looking for a therapist, there's several ways you can do that. You can talk to your PCP or doctor and see if there's someone locally they recommend. You can, of course, call your insurance company. Um, you can also use the Psychology Today website. They have a really great therapist finder where you can select different conditions. You could select chronic pain or your age range or your insurance. Um, and those are all great ways to find a therapist. If you can, it's great to find someone who's like a health psychologist or has some kind of history, you know, working with people that have medical conditions. You may not be able to do that, and they may not be familiar with FSHD. So you may need to have to educate them a little bit about that condition, but don't be afraid to do that. Therapists want to know and they want to be able to work with you. And so if you have to educate them a bit about your condition, I think that's going to help them be able to treat you. Um, relaxation skills. So there are many. I named today breathing, imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, but there are more that you can look into. So I would encourage you to find what works for you. And if something doesn't feel like a good fit, if it's not relaxing, let it go, try something else. Mindfulness, as I said, is always available to you, whether that's in a formal seated meditation practice, or like I said, even just choosing an everyday activity and trying to be more mindful or present in it that's something that can have benefit as well. Um, some helpful resources. Two very popular apps are Headspace and Calm. And I believe they both have like a pay component to them, but they have a free trial as well. So you could check it out and see. And you don't really need full access to an app or even an app at all to meditate, but it can be helpful to have a little bit of guidance at first. 10% Happier is a great one too. It also has a podcast, I believe. Um, 
and there's a book too. So you could look into that. And then if you're interested in books on mindfulness, I would definitely recommend John Kabat-Zinn or Thich Nhat Hanh. Those are a couple of great authors that write about mindfulness and could be helpful too. Um, and since we've, since I focused more on psychology and the mind part of it, we're going to pass it over now to Shelly, who's going to talk more about the mind-body connection. Thank you. Get this. Okay. Not my day for technology, so bear with me for just a second here. There we go. Okay. Everybody see that one? Okay. All right. All right, so I'm going to give just kind of a little recap of what we've talked about so far and add in a little bit more on the biological piece of that biopsychosocial model. So we've already talked about how pain is very complex, it's multidimensional, and I've titled this what we currently know about pain because our understanding of pain is always evolving. So um, things have changed in the last 10, 15, 20 years um, in our understanding of pain, definitely since I was in school. Um, so something to keep in mind is that this is ever evolving. We're always learning more. Um, and Dr. Matthews talked a little bit about how pain is not necessarily related to the amount of tissue damage that we have. We can have an injury without pain and we can have pain without an injury. So an amputation is an example where there's pain in a limb that's no longer there. And that is, just speaks a little bit to the fact that the pain is, is really originating from the brain as a result of all of these inputs that are coming into the nervous system. So when we think about pain, um, really I think we can talk about the pain coming from the brain, but even taking that a little bit further in that the pain is coming as the brain perceives a threat. And that could be a very real threat, like you've stepped on a nail or you've cut yourself with a knife, or it could be a perceived threat. And Krista talked a little bit about this, like maybe you have a gurgle in your stomach, but you've had pain and a lot of GI problems. So that little gurgle is a cue to your body that it's perceiving a threat that maybe isn't um, the same as it was the previous time. But however we look at that alert, it's really telling us we need to take an action of some sort. So maybe we need to change positions. We need to seek other ways to alleviate the pain. And when this starts, really pain can be protective. So if you think about stepping on a nail, the pain is protective. It's telling you that there's something wrong we need to address. We need to get the nail out. We maybe need to bandage the foot. Um, but the longer the pain goes on and as we move into more persistent or chronic pain, that pain becomes usually less about the biological system. And your alarm system, that alarm system can become more sensitive, um, more likely more, but also we can improve Prove the sensitivity less than the sensitivity is, which we'll talk a little bit when we talk about treatment. So I like to think of this as maybe the smoke detector that goes off. Um, and if you've ever lived in a place that had a smoke detector that was very sensitive, that every time you made something in the oven, the smoke detector went off. There wasn't a fire every time. We didn't need to call the fire department. We didn't need to get out the fire extinguisher. But that small um, stimulus of heat coming from the oven tipped off that system and said, oh, we really need to attend to this. So that's kind of what I think about when I think about that alarm system, is that it can be maybe a little bit overactive and not always very specific. Sometimes that smoke detector or the alarm system goes off and we don't know what caused it. Maybe, um, maybe there is a fire, maybe there isn't. Um, we have to kind of investigate and find out a little bit more about why that alarm is going off. Um, and one way I like to think about pain, and this is from Greg Lehman's work, I have his reference at the end of the um, presentation, but he talks about a cup analogy, which I think is a, is a nice way to think about pain. If we think about our cup, um, is kind of our capacity to handle all the stuff that's coming into our life and into our body and into our nervous system. And we can handle a little bit so that we have some capacity to handle um, fear. We have some capacity to handle fatigue, but when too many things are going in or too big of a volume of those things are coming into our cup, our cup starts to overflow. And that's when we get pain. So pain is really this kind of overflow of all the things that are coming into the nervous system um, that we don't really have the full capacity to handle at that moment. 
and that cup can vary in size. So if we think about it, I think of it as really that balance between how big your cup is, and we can think of the cup as really kind of all the good things or all the protective things that we do. So getting um, a good amount of sleep, eating a well-rounded diet, those things all make our cup a little bit bigger and increase our capacity. Um, and all the maybe contributors to pain that are coming in. So I have some examples listed here, but these are just a few of those things. Um, maybe your environment, maybe there are joint changes we need to attend to, your fatigue, your level of sleep, all of those things kind of come in. So we're really trying to find a balance where we can handle the volume of the things coming into the system. And furthering on from Greg Lehman's, I wanted to just touch on a little bit about biomechanics and pain, because I do think sometimes um, we lose, start to lose sight of some of that biological system. So we've talked a lot about all the things that are contributing to pain. And I do want to acknowledge that the biological system is a piece of that biopsychosocial model. So it's not to say that there aren't biological factors that are important. It's to say that they aren't necessarily the full picture. So Greg Lehman in one of his blog posts um, said, structure is not destiny, but it still might be important. So I think this is important when we start talking about management and attending to that is that we don't discount what's going on in the body in terms of strength, weakness, flexibility, posture, all of those things. But we acknowledge that they might not be the whole story. There might be other factors that we also need to address and attend to. And the good news is that there are some really good takeaways from kind of this idea that pain is a, a compilation of all of these things and that it's not just the body. So that tells us that if we have pain, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily harm to the body. So it doesn't mean that our tissues are damaged every time we have pain. So we can look at other options for what might be contributing to that pain. Um, there's also a good takeaway that we can improve pain without necessarily changing the body structure. So we don't necessarily have to change everything in the body, the posture, the joint changes, um, the strength to improve pain. And I know um, Chris talked a little bit about how we can't just address one thing and I absolutely agree with that, but we don't have to address everything. So maybe there are pieces that are going into that cup that are more difficult to address. Um, joint changes, Unfortunately, we can't always reverse those, but again, that doesn't mean we can't change the pain. We can come at some of those other targets and work on those things that are maybe a little bit um, easily, more easily changed and potentially um, can have a big impact on your pain. So just to recap, um, we've talked about pain being very individualized and unique to the person and the treatment should be too. So um, I like to kind of think of this as um, the idea that your pain management plan may look very different than your neighbor's pain management plan. It might look very different than your friend um, who has the same diagnosis or somebody that you've met through social media. We really want to make this about what factors are going into your cup. So your cup may look very different than somebody else's and what's going into that cup may be, look very different. Um, it's very important when we're talking about management to set goals that are important to you. And I will say this particularly when working with a physical therapist, but any other professional doesn't make a difference what my goals are for you. It's really important what your goals are for you. And our job is to help you meet your goals. So sometimes we lose sight of um, that when we're thinking about treatment plans and coming up with a plan that works best for you. But it's really important for you to do a little bit of self-seeking um, and determine what's really important for you to be able to do. Few little other tips. One is to smart, start small and build slowly. Sometimes we call this pacing, um, but we're trying to avoid that weekend warrior syndrome where we go out, we do a lot, we hit it all really hard. We spend two hours a day working on it for the first three days, and then we kind of fall off the bandwagon. It's really more um, beneficial if we can be consistent with the basics. Starting with just a few minutes a day can make a big difference, and we want to build on that slowly. So first step, um, if we follow kind of Greg Lehman's um, model here, just keeping with the cup, is to look at what's going into your cup. What is in the cup? And again, this could be a lot of different things. It could be biological factors. It could be your previous experience with pain or your previous experience with maybe physical therapy or a psychologist. Um, maybe it didn't go as well as you'd hoped. Uh, maybe you've tried treatments and they didn't work. So we wanna take all of those things and think about them. And then look at what can we do to address those things that are going into your cup, as well as what can we do to help you build a bigger cup? 
So again, those things coming in are the things that might we might consider contributors to pain. And when we think about building a bigger cup, we're thinking about all those um, habits that maybe help you develop a little bit more capacity or more resiliency. So thinking about good sleep habits, um, talking with a good friend, finding those resources that help you manage. Um, so these two are kind of interlinked. Sometimes we're doing, we're both addressing a contributor and building a cup, bigger cup at the same time. So we're, we're, I separate, don't separate these out because they're often linked together. So one option when we think about pain management, and we do have good evidence to um, suggest that education, learning about the mechanisms of pain, learning about how pain happens in our nervous system and our body is helpful in managing pain. It helps you empower yourself to know what to do. And these are just a few resources. Um, Why Do I Hurt by Adrian Lowe, Explain Pain by David Butler and Lormer um, Mosley. And then Recovery Strategies is by Greg Lehman that are available and written really at a level that um, is easy to understand and follow along. Another management strategy that we often talk about in physical therapy is how do we manage the environment? So Dr. Matthews talked on this a little bit, but maybe if the difficulty is that you have pain when you're trying to get your coffee mug out of the cabinet, maybe we move the coffee mug. So it's not always changing the task um, by changing your body. Maybe we change um, how you're completing that task. It could be setting up your workplace. It could be addressing environmental barriers. So if the stairs are really what triggers your pain, can we look at options to reduce the number of times you need to do the stairs or eliminate them completely? And then the other aspect of your environment that I wanted to touch on, which um, is touch on and explain pain, is a little bit about thinking about that environment, um, music, sound, lighting, temperature, all of those things play into how we feel. And I especially think about this when we start to think about um, rehab options and thinking like um, exercise. You know, I like to exercise in an environment that's a comfortable temperature. I like to have music that's motivating um, to me. And those things can all play into how we address the pain. Um, it also can be a time that we're talking about things like assistive devices. And that can range from braces and supports like back supports or abdominal binders to um, walking aids, canes, trucker, trekking poles, walker, um, things like scooters and wheelchairs. We look at these as aids and they might not be something you need all of the time, but it might be something that we utilize as part of a comprehensive program to manage pain if activities are contributing to the pain. Um, an example might be if walk, you can walk for five minutes, but if we're walking for 30 minutes, you have pain. We might look at an option for how we can reduce the pain for those longer duration activities. And there is a place, I think, um, for manual therapy and modalities as well. So when we think about manual therapies and modalities, I think about more of our hands-on techniques like joint mobilization, massage, as well as some of what I've kind of termed novel inputs to the nervous system or modalities. These are things like heat and ice or maybe acupuncture, TENS units, um, foam rolling, kind of self-massage. These are options that I look at as often an adjunct or maybe an entry level place into managing pain. Um, they usually aren't going to be those things that are gonna give you long lasting um, pain for a, a comprehensive management plan, but they might be the way that we decrease the sensitivity or decrease the input to your nervous system enough that you can do some of these other activities. Um, so I tend to think of these as we often term them a little bit more passive interventions. So somebody's doing something to you rather than you doing something for yourself. And long-term management, we do have good evidence to show that the more you can do for yourself, the better the outcome. So we look at these um, as kind of maybe an adjunct to the other options I'm talking about today. And then of course, as a physical therapist, I would be remiss if I did not address, address a movement option. So movement as the, um, along with education are two of the prime um, interventions that we do have evidence to support in terms of pain management. And this can be really a broad spectrum of movement. 
And my biggest thing when people ask, um, what type of movement should I do or what type of exercise is best? I usually say it's the one you're gonna do consistently. So there's not one type of exercise that necessarily is better than the other. Um, I wanted to point out that sometimes even imagined movements, so Krista talked a little bit about some guided imagery, we can also use that when we think about movement of sometimes we start with just imagining that you're doing a task and that you're not having pain while doing it. And that's a gateway into that nervous system. Um, we stimulate the same areas we do as if we were moving. And sometimes we can decrease the amount of um, impact or input we're getting from the joints and other tissues during those activities. It might include more of structured activities or exercises specific to a joint or um, trying to address a specific area of the body. Um, or more class activities like yoga, Pilates, aerobic things like walking, cycling, or even our everyday activities like cooking, gardening. If we think about those, they involve a lot of movement. So it doesn't have to be um, what we all think of as maybe a structured exercise plan in order to count in this movement category. And I wanted to conclude before I give resources, it's just a few tidbits about working with a physical therapist. I encourage you to think about your therapist as more of a coach um, who's helping guide you through this pain uh, management process, helping you recognize and learn and adjust your approaches versus somebody who is there to quote unquote fix your pain. Um, as much as I wish that we had a magic wand, we don't. Um, so it's really important to think about your role along with that of the therapist and how you can work together. Um, I know it can be very hard to find a therapist that is familiar with FSHD, and I would encourage you more so to look for somebody that is willing to learn and or somebody that is really good with pain management. I have several colleagues that I frequently refer to that are really great at helping people through pain. They aren't necessarily experts in muscular dystrophy, but they've learned enough to know what they need to um, in order to help guide you through that pain. Um, currently, we. We, some places, depending on your therapist, where you're located in your insurance, virtual and home visits might be an option. So if mobility is limiting your access, that could be a way to access a physical therapist. Um, we talked a little bit about that communication, but keeping in mind that giving feedback to your therapist really helps us manage that process. Know that there's often some trial and error. As much as we have education in these areas, um, sometimes we are making our best educated guess on where to start, and sometimes we're a little off, so we need to adjust that plan. And keeping in mind that fluctuations in pain might occur. So if pain fluctuates naturally, and it isn't um, always what you did in therapy or what you did at home or what you did over the weekend that causes that fluctuation in pain. So if you have fluctuations, we, as much as we try to avoid that, know that that doesn't necessarily mean the therapy isn't working. Try to work with your therapist to adjust as needed. And then a few references from FSHD Society has a, a great reference physical therapy um, for FSHD, which I strongly recommend sharing with a therapist, especially if you're working with a therapist who doesn't have a lot of training in FSHD. There are some good videos and presentations on exercise and fitness, um, both with some targeted exercise. Um, Nakia has a very good exercise, seated exercise um, example. And then the books that I talked about, Recovery Strategies, is actually a free option available on Greg Lehman's website if you Google that. Um, he's a physio and chiropractor um, based in Canada. Why Do I Hurt and Explain Pain are both, both available um, through Amazon or other online, real, uh, online places where you can order books. Really struggling there. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing. I think we're going to move on to questions. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, when I first approached uh, Kathy Matthews about pain, um, I, I felt from everything I'm hearing from patients, it is a multi-pronged, multi very complex issue in FSHD and uh, that it requires this multidisciplinary approach. So it's wonderful to see a kind of a much more holistic um, approach taken here, and I really appreciate that. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming online, but um, I might, uh, one thing I'm, I'm curious about myself is that because FSHD is very complex, I mean, you have muscle deterioration actually going on, which affects whole muscular systems, which affects movement and function, and also 
has a lot of uh, psychological impacts as well. Um, I hear such diverse descriptions of pain in FSHD, and I feel like one of the challenges is for patients to understand some of the possible sources and to have some of the language, kind of ideas and language to kind of process and perceive and talk about what they're experiencing. So um, I don't know if maybe I'll start with Kathy. Do you want to, is there anything you want to say so about that? I think I mentioned knowing what makes things hurt, the words, I mean, when I hear burning, stabbing, tingling, those sorts of things imply a different kind of pain than deep aching um, and the things that relieve it. If And it seems like a lot of the sort of neck and shoulders in people with FSHD, you've got gravity pulling on shoulders that are not well supported by muscles. And so a lot of times with FSHD patients, it seems like things that we can do to, it's, it's aching kind of pain and or low back pain, same sort of thing. So aching versus burning, stabbing is uh, one thing. And then again, what makes it better? What makes it worse in your experience helps us a lot. All right. And is it sometimes, is it, sometimes muscle strain? Is it sometimes also maybe nerve pain? Because maybe those structural... And that's one of the things that helps us. And I think it's not, there isn't one answer for everybody, but it's right. those sorts of descriptions that help us distinguish. I, my experience is that most of what I've seen in muscular, in FSHD has been more joint and muscle related and less neuropathic, mm -hmm. but it's very... Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, here is one on how can heat be used as a pain treatment option? I will take that one. So I, I, I really like heat. Um, I think it's a really nice option. Um, we used to kind of think ice versus to calm inflammation and heat um, more for long-term. That hasn't always panned out in the research. So usually I say whichever one feels better and Personally, I think the vast majority of people I work with find that heat feels better. So using a heating pad, you can use a moist heating pad um, that you can buy at a store. There's the plug-in kind. If you want a really inexpensive option, you can take like an old sock um, and fill it with rice or beans. Um, I like the sock with rice and throw it in the microwave. Um, just make sure you're not overheating it um, to cause burns. But um, placing that on the body part, 10, 15 minutes can feel really good. So I, I definitely recommend that again, heat alone often isn't enough to alleviate pain, especially persistent pain on a long-term basis, but using that before or after exercise, using it at the end of the day, you talked about muscle tension. That's a nice one sometimes for muscle tension, especially if we can use um, the combination of heat in a position where we've taken gravity a little bit out of the picture. So laying in a position where the muscles are no longer on stretch or strain, adding some heat is a really nice option. So I'm, I am a big fan of heat. That's one that I would say, you don't have to get rid of it, um, but using it and then adding on to it is usually going to be the best approach. Yeah. That might tie to question about um, suggestions for pain that comes from tight muscles. So you kind of alluded that applying heat might be one approach. Are there other? Yeah, um, I will. I'll start with the caveat that sometimes the feeling of tightness um, doesn't mean the muscle is itself is tight or that the muscle is short. So sometimes the muscles feel tight, even when we're in like a lengthened position. And that what comes to mind is especially the shoulder muscles. Gravity is often pulling on those muscles. So it's giving like kind of a distraction force on the muscle, but the muscle itself, what you feel might be tightness. Um, so some of that is teasing out a little bit, but stretching can be a nice option. Um, some of those gentle movements, again, especially if we can get in a position where gravity isn't pulling on the joint or giving that downward force for shoulder, for example, laying on your back is sometimes a nice place where we can do some gentle movements of the joint without gravity pulling. So those are kind of two places I look for it. Um, gentle yoga, some of the deep breathing that Krista talked about, diaphragmatic breathing, some of those options um, can help just relax our whole nervous system. So that fight or flight, again, we kind of get in that, like everything gets escalated and then everything starts to feel tight. I think about that um, if you 
can imagine a situation recently where you've been maybe a little anxious or nervous, our whole system starts to kind of protect us, um, so to speak, when it doesn't really need to. So sometimes right. even that deep breathing of just letting things go is a nice option. So we have a number of people asking about uh, whether supplements, nutritional supplements can help. I think a lot of patients feel that they are beneficial, but they're wondering, is there evidence behind that or at least a hypothesis around that? So I'm, I'm, I'll take this one I'm, because I'm glancing through here and I'm going to answer supplements and marijuana in the same. Okay. Package, okay. Because some of the answers are the same. Um, in terms of medical marijuana, CBD oil, CBD products, I've had some patients have found them to be extremely helpful. Some patients have tried them for a while and said it didn't do anything for me. So it depends on, you know, don't break the law if, um, depending on what is legal and safe in your area, being in jail is not going to make anybody feel better. But um, depending on what's available in your area, those are things that are certainly worth trying. Um, we don't know. And then the thing that is the same about them is, especially if you're getting things on the street rather than from a dispensary, we don't know for sure what's in it. So, and that applies to supplements too, that um, we don't, we know from lots of studies that we don't know what are in them. Um, so if you have limited funds, don't spend all your college fund on supplements. Um, if you find something that works and has no side effects, go for it. Um, it's again, there, if there was a supplement that worked for everybody, we would all be taking it and we're not. So there are things that work for some people. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, here's a question maybe on the psychological side. Some of the pains we're facing are ones that are imposed by our family members and colleagues in the workplace. How do you re recommend it? dealing with that? Yeah, I can speak to this one. Um, certainly, it's, of, of course, frustrating to have negative interactions, whether it's family members or coworkers. Um, unfortunately, we cannot control other people, but only ourselves. So the first step is recognizing that something is frustrating you or giving you stress or having some negative interaction. And notice what happens in the body. So, you know, do you kind of tense up your neck and shoulders every time that coworker makes that comment? you know, or every time this family member does this thing, are you, you know, do you, does your stomach tighten up? Just kind of paying attention to yourself and what you can control and then trying to do something about that. So maybe it's relaxing the shoulders, taking that deep breath in and out. You know, if, if it's communicating with that person, you know, in a way that you can let them know kind of how you feel, that might be the right thing. But it's, it's difficult when we're surrounded by negative people. So, you know, it goes back to you can only control yourself and how you respond to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here about prescription pain medication and potential risks related to addictiveness, I, I guess, especially with opiates. Are there less addictive options? That so all the opioid medications are have the potential for addiction. So they can be important parts of your treatment um, plan. But I think most of us will ask you to work with a pain clinic and most pain clinics then will use a multi-modality approach. If what you need is an opioid to get through the pain and it's ruining your life and you know there is a role for opioids, but they yes, they are all addictive. And they all have side effects. So no, there is no magic wand. Right. Uh, is it typical for patients to have pain after activity, including physical therapy? Um, this person says, I've had several days of increased pain to the point of being in bed after mild physical therapy or activity. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so it is, it's, it's not uncommon. Um, another little kind of lingo we sometimes use is like, um, sore isn't, isn't damaged. So we talked about hurt isn't damaged. So sometimes we'll look and some of it depends a little bit on how long you've had pain of how long I would say it's common to have pain. So after intervention. So if we think about just an average person, um, doing some exercise, if I go out and uh, run a marathon, I'm going to be sore the next day. Um, so it's, some of it is kind of knowing how much you did. And if that maybe was too much, so it sounds like if the pain is increased for a week, I would say, yeah, maybe we need to scale that back. 
Um, if it's the next day or sometimes even um, the day after, I think Greg Lehman has a like, don't believe the morning after because the morning is a liar. Um, so the morning after might not be the time to judge, but if 24 to 48 hours after, sometimes that's still in that like mm, common to be sore, but if it's going on more than that, it might've been too much. And that's where I would say communication. Sometimes we need to scale it back. Um, sometimes we also talk about people that, um, sometimes if you're somebody that tends to work through the pain, you're somebody that tries to push through it, we might need to scale that program back, mm -hmm. um, and really start at that point where you have minimal, no, sometimes no pain isn't always an option, but minimal pain or not increased pain and really grade that really slowly. So ideally no, if it's going on several days, probably too much. Okay. Thank you. We've had several people ask um, about TENS, T-E-N-S. Uh, can you, maybe not everybody knows what that is, if you can quickly explain what that is and whether that's a uh, effective for short um, so or long term. Is, yeah, yeah, there is some research to show that TENS can be effective. Um, I would put this in the category of worth a try. Um, there are some con some limitations in terms of if you have implants or pacemakers or things like that, but otherwise not very low risk um, intervention. It's a type of neuromuscular stimulation. So you put electrodes um, on the body part, on the body somewhere around that part, and it gives a low level um, stimulus that can be adjusted. You can buy units on Amazon. Um, usually I would recommend if you are working with a therapist to see if they have a unit that they can try with you. I know that's um, a little less common now than it used to be in terms of people having them, but um, you can play with some settings. Again, some people find it a lot of relief with it. Some people, not so much. Sometimes it's the work some days, not other days, but um, check with your provider to make sure there aren't con contraindications, but otherwise it's pretty low risk. So I feel like it can be worth a try. And it's that similar kind of different stimulus to the nervous system. It's giving your nervous system a different stimulus um, for lack of getting into too much complexity to kind of block the pain pathway. Mm -hmm. okay. We are a little past the hour, but there's still a few questions. If you have time, uh, if we could do a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, quick question, is it safe to take a 200 milligram Advil every day? So, um, <laughs> yes, I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would say this is in the category of Yes, that's a pretty benign sort of thing, but do talk to your primary care doctor because you should probably have your renal function checked once a year or something. But, um, but so make sure your primary care doctor knows you're doing it. Um, but if it helps, that's a good thing to do. Okay. There's a question about, um, I guess, chiro, I guess chiropractic techniques. Are those, can those be effective for pain management? So I think a lot of people um, have good relief from chiropractic techniques. Um, often it is short-lived. You want to make sure that you go to a chiropractor who understands that you have a neuromuscular disease and that you don't have the normal protective muscle strength and tend to say that we like people to not have a lot of manipulation because of the potential for injury because you don't have the normal protective, but chiropractic can be quite helpful for pain. Thank you. Um, someone's asking about hydrotherapy, jacuzzis. Yes. <laughs> if you can safely Plus get in and out, yeah, okay. if you can safely about, get in and out of the uh, spa or whatever you're using, the, then yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. What about compression garments? I, yes, I do hear um, there are a couple levels. So I definitely have worked with people that feel even the off the shelf like Spanx, um, or if you think about high compression workout clothing, that they do feel like that gives them a little bit more support around the joints and can be helpful. So, um, and I think there, I glanced through, I think there was a question specifically about a DMO, which is a more specific customized um, to you device. Um, with that type of device, I think it's highly dependent on who's making the device and who's measuring for the device. Um, they can be hard to get on. So they are pretty high compression. So often it's difficult to get it on and that can be a limiting factor. Or you might need somebody to help you with that. So again, in that worth a shot option, um, sometimes I'll start with more off the shelf things you can buy at the store and see before I would go to a DMO, which is much higher expense okay. point. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a couple questions about specific, someone says they have constant pain in their toes. 
Have you seen that? And what can you recommend for that? Um, I have not seen that, but if it's like constant, I would definitely, I mean, there are a lot of things. It could be gout. It could be a neuropathy. It could be, so they really, if they have constant pain in their toes, they need to go see their doctor about it. Okay. Do you have any recommendations on a low inflam inflammation diet? I saw that question. I thought it was interesting. Um, the low inflammation diets don't have enough sugar for my taste, but um, if you, there are some really nice books, uh, especially I think in like MS literature, the low inflammation diets tend to be extremely healthy. So they would be good for anybody. Um, Terry Walls here at Iowa has written a lot about this W-A-H-L-S. Um, so if you can do it, go for it, definitely. <laughs> All right. Um, there's oh, someone asking about advice on special support devices for stomach and shoulders. So Anyone want to take that? <laughs> for stomach, I um, my, often my first go-to is like an abdominal binder, um, which you can buy off the shelf or you can buy... Um, I've even heard um, if you're a more petite person that some of the thigh wraps at the like five and below stores um, come in that. So sometimes I'll start with that. Shoulders, I, I find to be more um, challenging. I'll be very honest. Um, the supports that are out there don't always provide the support I want. Um, they can be hard to get on. Our colleagues in the UK, I know, have had some good luck with something more like a DMO that's been customized for that. So it's not to say that there aren't instances where it would work. Um, I've had a little less success there, but for abdominal binders, I do find some support. So I'll mention we have a blog post by from Rick Whitehead. He reviews several different abdominal binders that he's found helpful and brands and so on. You could so readers can look that up on our website. And recently we posted from uh, someone in South Africa who was using Autobox. Uh, like a shoulder brace and he uses he kind of hacked it he uses two of them and he said it's providing him with a lot of good scapular stabilization so you might want to check that out he posted a video which we shared over a blog on our website as well and um oh, we have a comment i just want to share from someone who says they have used ayurvedic medicine um which they have found really helpful especially for pain have you any thoughts about Ayurvedic medicine? Yeah, so um, I've had I've had a number of patients who've um, used Ayurvedic medicines, and I always just tell them make sure that you talk to your Ayurvedic provider, understand what's in the medication as much as possible, and it's in like other a lot of other supplemental things. Um, if it works without side effects, that's wonderful. And, and some people are, do find nice success. Right. Yeah, I've had, a, had people caution with Ayurvedic medicine, just that you, like with anything else, supplements, everything that you put in your body, you need to know the source and what kind of quality controls. Are they transparent about the ingredients and so on? That's important. So I think we are a little, 10 minutes past our, uh, our time. Uh, so we will wrap up now, but thank you so much. I'm going to go back to Beth to close out our hour. All right. Um, gosh, thanks everyone for attending our FSHD University webinar today. Very special thank you to our special guests. Um, you guys had the, so, such helpful information, such great resources, and thanks for answering all of our questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. Um, our next FSHD University webinar is on Thursday, May the 5th. We're going to discuss the FSHD Society's new genetic testing program. It's called Test FSHD. So we'll explain that program, um, who should consider getting tested, and how to actually participate in the program. So um, that'll be Thursday, May the 5th. Um, tune in Thursday of next week at nine o'clock Eastern, that's nine o'clock PM Eastern for the premiere of our FSHD radio show on either YouTube or Facebook. Our host, Tim Hollenbach, will be talking with one of our most active community members, um, Dr. David Younger. You may have heard of them, um, but you can always listen to the show at your convenience wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Um, please be sure to visit our website events calendar for all of the upcoming events on um, chapter programs, chapter meetings, wellness, and of course, these wonderful education events. So thank you again, panelists, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>